No black on there, but hope one, two, three, four. Okay, so good thing I just want to pick your brain about the early days of Gilman. And uh, this, this is trying to release a book and do a big. Well, I got down from DC, so the 930 Club when they had their 10th anniversary, they had nine bands playing in like two nights. Kind of chaos. And uh, the band of DC book came out around that time. And we want to do kind of the same thing at Gilman on the 10th anniversary. Um, coffee table type book with a brief history, but everyone's history is going to be different. I can already see that. But um, I don't want it to be so much text, but more pictures and things like that. But I want, you know, I want to get a lot of different opinions and slams going on there. Um, I'm sure it'll take on a lot of its own. But um, so basically I wanted to start with you and uh, go from there. I've got a few things here, but basically I just want like I said, to pick your brain, like we can start with like... Okay, before before you ask me any questions, are you, uh, are you talking to other um, people who were there from day one? Yeah, I will be, yeah. Okay, like... I eat Brian Edge and people like that. Right, okay. Yeah, and I, I also wanted to ask who you suggest okay. I talk to or right. things. And yeah, I, w I wanted to be pretty in-depth, but okay. I wanted to start right. with, you know, the person I heard about associated with Gillen, you know, Right. First off, when I was a kid. Um, so, I mean, just start from the beginning, like, how did the idea come up? I mean, I heard Bill Graham stories, etc. cetera. I um, just want to start with, like, sort of when the idea was conceived and then when it, right. when it actually came to fruition. Um, yeah, there, at one point there had been an attempt made by some of us to get a, a, a all ages type thing started in Berkeley. That was probably about three or four at least three or four years prior to uh, maybe even longer um, to when we actually got Gilman started. And uh, we got, a, back then we had gotten a crew of people together and Bill Graham had said he would help fund the thing. He had come on our radio show where we had criticized him for being involved at all with the punk scene and um, he said, well, I'm not out to exploit the punk scene and to prove it, I'll put up the money if you find a place, get the people, do all the research. So we did all of that, and then he said, fuck you. <laughs> Call us bluff, huh? So, yeah, it was just a, a, like a publicity stunt he pulled, but he wasn't going to back it up. Anyway, but many years passed after that, so that really wasn't the... Uh, the uh, start of Gilman. But then uh, sometime around 85, something like that, um, I decided I was going to try and get serious about uh, doing that. And um, uh, started looking uh, for a location and then ran into this lunatic named Victor Hayden who um, had a similar idea, and so he started looking as well for a place, and then he, he actually found the uh, 924 Gilman location. Um, and uh, who else was involved in? Martin Sprouse. Um, I guess we were the first three, maybe Brian Edge. Just, and we went, anyway, me, Martin, and Victor went and looked at this place, thought it was great. Um, I was hesitant, but everyone said, okay, you know, you got to do it, you got to do it. So we did it. Um, we talked to the landlord, got the lease. That was like in April of 85, something like that. No, 86. April of 86. Right, and then uh, and then we tried started trying to pull together the people that could make the thing happen, you know, putting up flyers saying, "Okay, we've got this location. Here's the idea. We want to try and make it happen." Um, and then what weekly meetings were held, 
at, at the premises to try and see if we could get you know enough people to do it, and, and it came together pretty decently fast. Um, and tried to come up with okay, well, what kind of place is it going to be other than all ages? And decided on the basics, you no know, alcohol stuff, body blah. Um, but we were completely oblivious to what we were about to go through, um, which was eight months of paying rent on a place and not being able to put on shows and having to put, we ended up in putting up like over $40,000 um, before the doors even opened. Um, going through, you know, hearings with the city, uh, you know, I had done a lot of um, precinct organizing for Berkeley Citizens Action years before that, and so they were in power at the time in Berkeley, so I sort of called on friends who were now in on different boards uh, with the city and said, okay, you know, <laughs> Now it's time to <laughs> cash in the chips, and uh, hopefully you will vote for the existence of this place. And um, the city was pretty supportive. Um, uh, I mean, even the, I remember the, the mayor at the time, Gus Newport, was you know, totally supportive. But, uh, um, and then we had, you know, also, you know, the, every department, you know, the fire department, the health department, the police department, everybody has to do their inspection, and had to fireproof this and build this to code. We had to uh, get rent jackhammers and put in, um, you know, uh, totally new plumbing. So, I mean, you know, here are all these, like, ridiculous punk rockers jackhammering. <laughs> the, the, the inside of Gilman was amazing. It was the most surreal thing you'd ever seen. It was just like the most intense fog from all this cement in the air. Um, but it was really cool. I mean, it was like, I guess one of the guys in Corrupted Morals, his dad was a uh, a plumber, and so he came down and he signed off for the stuff. We did all the work, and he showed us what to do. But, and same with, you know, we had to build the bathrooms. We had to have wheelchair accessible. DIY. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. And, uh, and none of us knew shit about any of this stuff, so we had to learn in a hurry how to do construction and then pass inspections. And did you take any pictures of that stuff? You guys were doing? Yeah, well, I'm sure. Sure, somebody did. I'm gonna put out classifieds calling for stuff like that. Right, right. I mean, there was, you know, there was a very some very funny stuff that happened, or almost tragic stuff. Like, uh, I remember this one time, Murray Bowles was up on a ladder against that the stage wall, the back wall, all the way towards the right corner. And he was up there, and we were putting up those. The soundproofing boards that are up there, and he was way at the top of the ladder, and no one was footing the ladder. Suddenly, the ladder started sliding down, and there was Murray on top, way up on top. <laughs> the thing is sliding, <laughs> and, and actually, I, you could still see the uh, groove marks where it went down with Murray at the helm. Um, and somehow, he started backpedaling down trying to get down the ladder before it cut loose and went. And um, fortunately, Murray didn't die that day. It <laughs> came close. Oh, <laughs> um, where the, the very f There used to be, you know, where the sound booth is now, well, that was part of a platform that went out further towards the, the stage wall. Um, and we had to rip part of that down. And I remember Josh from Wingnut climbing out there, and suspended in midair with a hammer, smashing things. Uh, and so he's just like, eventually just clinging to a board, smashing all these other <laughs> boards. And, you know, people did insane things. But anyway, it took eight months to get that 
fucker built, and it wasn't until the very day of the, it was New Year's Eve day that the fire department okayed the last thing. We had to spray the walls with some weird kind of spray to make them even more fireproof. And they okayed it that afternoon, and we had the first show that night, New Year's Eve. Oh, so um, I thought it was the first, but it was New Year's Eve. Yeah, it was New Year's Eve, um, 86, 87. Who, who played that first show? Christ. Christ. I don't remember. Victor booked it. Is this Victor guy still around? Victor Hayden? No. He moved back to L.A. from whence he came. Victor was really an eccentric and weird artist. He was the guy who ran Alchemy Records. Oh, really? And everyone wanted to kill him. <laughs> like Neurosis and all these people wanted to kill Victor. I remember stories about Alchemy. Right. Anyway, Victor was, he was so out there. Um, but he was sort of, he did find the place. So was he the first booker? Or did he was the first booker. Him and Kamala were the first bookers, and they lasted about two months. <laughs> um, we had a policy at the time and, uh, of we weren't going to announce who's playing on shows. I loved that policy. I thought it was great. All we would guarantee is you would get a great show for your whatever, three bucks or four bucks, whatever it was at the time. And, uh, but I thought, you know, that would take a lot of the ego out of, out of stuff where, you know, people would come to have the experience of going there, and as long as we maintain the quality of what they see, then it would be, word would spread that way. Mm -hmm. and so we had no flyers except flyers saying, there's a show this Friday. Mm -hmm. How many and bands play? Mostly in the beginning. It was five, just like. Really? Yeah. yeah. Did you have membership right from the beginning? Yeah. How did that idea come up? Was that we can actually see these flyers here, sort of talking about what we would hope Gilman would become, and it's pretty much yeah all the same stuff as today. You know, no alcohol, no was violence. Was the membership thing like? Was that a, yeah. Was that to avoid zoning things, or um, was that just? No, it was a way of. Um, primarily a way of trying to control a lot of the violence that was going on at the time. Because, it, I mean, that was one of the reasons we were starting this place, which was that the farm was the main venue at that point, and it was just out of control in terms of violence. It was major, major, major skinhead stuff going on. Um, and then, you know, sort of, there's a combination of that and the New York macho hardcore type mentality going on, and nothing else. And so we figured, okay, well, this is, you know, we got to make this sort of a, a self monitoring thing or it isn't going to work. And so that was the idea with the membership. And also, though, it, it turned out that the additional revenue generated by the membership was the, made the difference between survival or not. <coughs> um, was it lifetime memberships right away? Did yeah. You, this, was it they all lifetime memberships, all with cars, or could you buy like a year? No, they were. It was lifetime, which we then later changed to annual. I'll show you one of the original cards. I have some of those. You, also, you did change the annual annual before you you bowed out before. I believe so. Okay. In my mind, I think it's still a case that someone comes <laughs> right and tries to get right. in and there's this right. big thing at the right. door. Right. <laughs> But I think, I, I'm fairly sure that we changed it, but I can't remember. Okay. Um, but anyway, yeah, you can see that you know, here are a lot of the early shows, and they were all five band nights. Um, and the way it was then was Friday nights were sort of the m more experimental uh, oh, really? shows, and Saturday nights were more the hardcore shows. Um, and then, and then we usually had Sunday shows as well back then. You know, we would have uh, Sunday afternoon or evening shows. How did the neighborhood accept you when you guys first moved in? Well, part of getting the permit involved us um, politicking the neighborhood, um, convincing the <laughs> auto body shops and everything that we would be a good neighbor. 
and uh, and I'm sure they all wanted to kill us afterwards. And and then convincing some of the neighborhood, the church people, and stuff like that that we weren't going to be bringing drugs and stuff into the neighborhood. And I'm sure they wanted to kill us after that too. Um, and. Uh, I think the most amazing thing was the landlord, who it's still the same landlord. Same landlord, Jim, who was a total nervous Nelly, and I thought, you know, there's no way. I mean, we were honest with the guy, but still, we thought that you know, there's a difference between being honest and when he sees what is really going to happen. And somehow the guy, has, I mean, for somebody who I always perceived as being pretty uptight. He's trying to be cool, but right. he's basically <laughs> uptight. I was amazed that the guy didn't have a heart attack, and like, or he conducts his, you know, some of his he classes <laughs> inside yeah. the yeah. place, <laughs> and somehow he's just gotten used to it. But great. Um, anyway, God, what were some of the other things? Oh, building the stage—that was pretty amazing. Um, getting people who had, you know, carpentry skills to design the whole thing, and then, then all these punks show up with, you know, all tool belts and, <laughs> and, and fucking put it together, and that thing is solid, I and mean, it's still solid. Yeah, it is. And, you know, that's ten years it's after It's a monster later. of a <laughs> Right. But they did that in one day, um, and, you know, just have the design blueprints out, and... Yeah, but the whole thing, I mean, that was the thing. We had to do everything to code for the city. So, I mean, we actually had to get architects to, to do, you know, to do blueprints for us. And, and uh, you know, most of them were, like, you know, some friend of somebody's dad, you yeah. know, kind of thing to do it. <laughs> so, that was cool. But anyway, for the first, mm, I don't know, month or two, we had these shows where we didn't, announce who was playing. We had other concepts going, like uh, we had a mind fuck committee whose job it was to um, was to fuck people up um, in a creative way. I mean, the whole idea with the shows was to sort of, you know, if you go to a punk show, it's very predictable. You know what you're going to get. Boom, 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 and you're out of there. And it's so easy to have it be consumerist. Yeah. So one of the things, besides not announcing bands, was to uh, have this mindfuck committee, and they would think up concepts to do that would make people like be weirded out and remember something. And so, like I remember, the best you know, thing they ever did was this th they had this thing where it was going to be like South Africa night, where at the door everyone was given passes like people in South Africa had. Mm -hmm. And um, and then at some point, a bunch of people in cop uniforms came into the club, demanded passes from people. If they didn't have them, they were thrown against the wall and thrown out of the club <laughs> and shit. <coughs> um, anyway, to do things that would, you know, just, what the fuck, make things unpredictable. We also had, right from the get-go, an open mic uh, policy, which was that at any point during a set, excuse me, um, oh, so with this open mic, uh, the idea was for people in the audience to be able to confront bands and vice versa, bands to be able to confront people, but that the whole idea was at any point, if you don't like the lyrics, if you don't like their attitude, get up there and talk about it. You can do it in the middle of their set, whenever the fuck. And that we made the bands understand that they had to deal with that. That that was part of, if they were going to play there, that's what they had to deal with. And uh, unfortunately, again, very few people availed themselves of this. But some people did. And I remember in the very first show, um, I think it was Bessie from Reno, who was in that old band, The Rex, got up there and confronted one of the bands about their lyrics. And uh, and at various times, I mean, I know I did a couple of times during shows, I would go up on stage and, 
asked the band what the fuck was that about. Um, and, and I remember there were some shows where we just stopped right in the middle of the show and had a meeting. <laughs> yeah, turned the lights off and had a big fucking meeting, a sit-down meeting right in the middle of the show just to deal with some shit that was going on. And I, I, to me, that was what a punk club and show should be about. Yeah. We um, do that stuff now, we're called PC fucks. And right. So did, you call, did they call you hippies? or? Yeah, some people did. And it, I mean, you know how it's sort of getting bad again in terms of the, a lot of the mentality that, well, it's still a fucking picnic compared to how it yeah, was in 86, 87. It was, every show was like going to war. That's how it felt. Anyway, <clears throat> There were a lot of, you know, a lot of concepts we were trying. We, you know, the, the bands had to do cleanup. That was how it worked. When the show was over, the bands did cleanup. That's pretty much how we do that now. Well, but, you know, the, the point is they're the only ones getting paid. Yeah. They should do cleanup. And the, the whole idea was to try and create a, an alliance between participants and bands to run the place. In other words, that... You know, they are the ones who benefit. They are the ones who should be actually doing it. But the way it all worked out was much more in a traditional thing. In other words, the policy with not announcing bands didn't work. People didn't come unless, you know, they knew Friends who was playing. Whatever. So that didn't work. Um, How was attendance in the beginning, though, when they were unannounced? The first... You know, a few shows it was pretty good because it was brand new, but then it was sort of t it tapered off, and then, you know, those shows where word got out were better attended, that kind of thing. Anyway, and then very shortly after that, Victor went insane and moved to L.A., and Kamala didn't want to do the booking anymore, so I ended up doing the booking as well. And so, and it just, you know, it wasn't good. It wasn't working that way. And a lot of the things didn't work. You know, the Mindfuck Committee worked a little bit, but it didn't really work. And um, and the thing with the bands doing the work, yeah, they did it, but they did it grudgingly. Um, uh, you know, and when we'd go to pay the bands, it would, you know, we'd say, okay, here's the amount of money. This is what I suggest the breakdown be, but what do you guys think? I mean, this band traveled so so for long, but you've been around for X amount of years. What do you think? And we try and get everybody to. You know, so that's where that, Still do that. that that whole policy came from. Um, but more often than not, it was bands being bands and and not really with the idea. I mean, there were some bands that you know you know would donate back their money if they could or would. Uh, you know, help, you know, like you know, Matt from Op Ivy did the garbage disposal every week, and, you know, different people did different things, but overall, the ideas really didn't catch. And after a year and a half of... Uh, did you mm -hmm. did you have security back then at all? How did that work? Well, first we did our own, and um, I, well, what I was going to say was that I mean, the skinhead thing was getting really yeah. wicked. I mean, every show, there would be tons of racist skins showing up. Most people wanted to be inside and be happy. And they didn't want to go outside and confront these people. And so it would be me and Martin and little shrimpy guys and these <laughs> big mean fuckers. And it was like, you know, hey, do I want to risk my life? You know, I was getting death threats here, all sorts of things. You know, well, so everyone can play in the sandbox. And that's what it felt like. And people, you know, I, at some point, I said, look, okay, let's buy baseball bats. We have a nice little plan. Half the story. people go out the back door, half the people go out the front door, and we kill them. <laughs> you know, and that's the end of the problem. I would have voted for that. <laughs> and people wouldn't do it. And it's like, all right, but I'm tired of being, you know, the front man here. And, uh, Anyway, so then at a certain point we decided, okay, we're going to hire uh, security for a while. 
and so we did. We hired, um, at first it was like some off-duty old cop, or reserve cop or something like that. And that worked pretty good. The skinheads would drive up, see that guy there, and then they'd leave. And that, that, that did pretty well for a while. Afraid of a rent a cop. <laughs> right. Well, he looked like a Berkeley cop. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but then he couldn't do it there was, you know, for a while. So we, we ended up getting a rent a cop. And that actually did okay, too, for a, a while. And then we eventually we figured we had scared off most of them and, and, and stopped doing that. Um, but I mean, it would be, I mean, every week there'd be tons of these guys come. They would just, you know, come up outside. You look like a Jew. Boom! Jeez. You know, and they were just, it was like insane. Totally insane. And, um, eventually I burned out. It's like, you know, I don't want to risk my life all the time. And I really felt like the place had not lived up to its potential. I mean, there were certain high moments and amazing moments like, you know, when the feeders played there and just, <laughs> did, I don't, did you ever hear that story? No. You know who the feeders are? I remember the name. Yeah, there's there this crazy um, band with this guy named Frank Discussion. Uh -huh. And uh, anyway, they came with animals, roadkill tied on the ends of their guitar, and threw it into the audience. People lost it, lost it, lost people, turned in their memberships. People, you know, stopped the show, which was great, and had these big discussions. and. And then, but then people called the cops, they called the SPCA, oh, they tried to get the club shut down. I mean, this was members. And it was just like, but for a month after that, it was great because everyone was talking about all these things. And, you know, it's so like, and then, you know... Did they think they had really killed animals for the show or something? Who knows what they thought. <laughs> but they, you know, they were so offended. And... Um, but it was great. I mean, it challenged everybody to have to communicate about these things. So it was like, I don't know, I thought that was the high point of, of Gilman, at least in a lot of ways. It was like, that's what punk shows should be about, where everyone's arguing and talking, and for weeks later, they're like, you know, all worked up about it. People's brains should be on when they leave the show, not off. And... But that very rarely happened. Anyway, at a certain point, me and Martin especially, and Brian Edge, you know, as well, I mean, he had gotten punched out. He had been, you know, just, uh, all of us just felt like, eh, enough. So we shut it down. We just said, <clears throat> I, I, my feeling was, this scene does not deserve a place this cool. And if people aren't going to really make it theirs, they're just going to act like consumers, then I don't, I don't want to be killing myself for that. So we stopped it. We shut it down for a month or two. And then some of the people that had been working there and some newer people asked if they could reopen it. And at that point, I mean, they seemed sincere. And I, so what we said they, is... They missed it once it was gone. Yeah, yeah. You know, when we shut down for remodeling a couple of years ago, right. tenants went through the roof and we opened it because everyone thought we were gone. Right. Yeah. Right. Did you, was it from the beginning, um, if you volunteered, you got in free? Mm -hmm. and right. If you worked the show, you got in free to be a sign-up list before the show and stuff. But it was fairly regular crew that worked the show. Right. Right. Um, anyway, so... Um, when that, you know, we talked to the landlord, he said sure, so we passed the lease on to them, we gave them the sound system and everything in the place and said, you know, here. Do you know who really spearheaded the reopening of it? The, the group of people you remember? Yeah, what, what's his name? I see him sometimes. He's really God. He's a scientist. A scientist? Yeah, he works. I was really quiet, guy. 
shit. Maybe it'll come to me okay. by the time we're done here, but he was the main person that sort of took on the... I can also want to talk to the right. ask him. Right. Um... Did anyway, but so I... But, uh, did any of the same people that, that helped build the club help reopen it? Like a, a couple. Josh and Murray or any of those people? There were, there were, well, no. Of the original, original crew, no. But there were some people that had come in to maybe the last six months. Fairly regular. Except I think maybe Tall Tim was the only person probably there from day one. Was he doing sound in the beginning? He was doing, I think he was. How many people did sound? Well, it was, there, were, there were a couple of people originally trying it, but then Radley came along, and Radley ended up doing it every night for yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Um, I mean, he would occasionally train somebody, but he was the, the man. Where did uh, most of the capital come from? Maximum. Yeah, it was uh, the original... 40,000 or whatever it was and then the first year it lost on top of that it lost money um, and then the second year it broke did a little better than break even did you ever make back your money oh no the magazine never did no but we weren't intending to that wasn't uh, ever an issue and like I said when, when the new people took it over we gave them the equipment, just gave it to them, and then the sound system and board and all that shit. And then I think we said, I don't know, we matched money with them. In other words, like if they, we wanted to make sure they were serious. So um, we said, you raise X amount of money and we'll give you X amount of money as well. So then I think we gave them some money to get the thing going again. Why the East Bay? Why Berkeley? But they only see it could have happened to. Um, well, at the time, uh, yeah, at the time, things in the city here were so fucked with the racist skins. You had two main skinhead gangs, um, and they were just terrorizing. You know, do they have names? For them? Well, one was uh, SF Skins. <laughs> Um, and then the other was uh, the group that eventually, the, the main guy was this guy, Bob Hike, and he eventually became the head of war, white area. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, but I can't remember what his little gang was called. Oh, the Bash Boys. That's right. <clears throat> anyway, the city was totally fucked up. And... Uh, and also, because we the, the radio show was based in Berkeley. It was at the time. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. right. Maximum first address was Berkeley. Right? Yeah. We had been doing the radio show there since 77. Um, and also, up till the year before Gilman started, we had been living there. So. Um, you had connections, too, in that city. Yeah. I mean, it was. And it also because yeah because of the political yeah. environment is, would have been a lot easier well, at that point. Uh, Feinstein was mayor here and she was trying to shut punk down. Okay. Oh yeah, that they were driving. I mean the main punk scene was up, you know, down Broadway and yeah. Mabuhai and stuff, and they were going to get punk out of San Francisco. The matrix program for punks, huh? right? Um, did you ever envision it, la envision it lasting 10 years? No, I never really, th I never thought of it in those terms. Now, looking back and saying, oh my God, 10 years. But I guess what's more, I guess it's surprising that it's still there. But it's more surprising that 10 years have gone by that fast. <laughs> I mean, um, that, to me, is what's really amazing. And what I think is really cool is that an awful lot of the people that were sort of the main people are still involved with punk. Um, if not going, yeah. Right. And so I, I think that's pretty interesting, too. Um, 
but yeah, it's hard to imagine that. I mean, it was it was ten years ago this month that we signed the lease, and it's just like oh, never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm glad, I mean, I'm glad that Gilman exists in the shape it does. I think that, you know, I was really disappointed that it didn't become more than that. And I, I really think it only lives up to about 10% of its potential. Um, but still, it's really good that something like that exists. Yeah, lots of happens with collectives. Right. It can only go in so many directions because there's so many people pulling at it, so it mm -hmm. takes the least common denominator, and right. in order for longevity, it takes the, the easy way out most of the time. Right. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine the beginning, because now we get so much shit just for not having major little bands or what we consider sexist bands. Right. I've been the main booker for two and a half years now. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Right. And, uh... See if I'm missing anything here. Which crap I wrote down. I covered most of it. Did well, I always hear about like I don't I don't know how much the very first group of people resented the next group of people taking over, but you hear later on about the different eras, you know, coordinator to coordinator mm -hmm. resenting the last group and the new kids pushing out the older group. Right. And it happens over and over again. Was there any of that in the beginning, like the new? crop starting it up and people are like, no, I don't go to the New Gilman or any of that. Maybe on so, uh, on a small level, but it sure wasn't a, like at least among the, I mean, those of us that had done the uh, hard work, I mean, I think it was hard for us to go back to Gilman just because we were so burnt. I mean, I don't think I went to any shows for about a, at least a half year after yeah. that. I mean, I was just, man, if I never go to another show again, good. <laughs> you know, it's like I was so exhausted, and then some. Um, I mean, I mean, literally, I think it took years off a lot of our lives. I'm not kidding. It just was like that. I mean, it's like just those eight months before we ever opened the doors. And it's just like, had I ever known it was going to be like that, where we were going to have to do that kind of you know, be put through that kind of test. I never would have done it. Never, never, never. But when the new people came along, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were going to be, that it wasn't pie in the sky. You know, that, that if they were going to take over the lease and we were going to give them the equipment, that they had their feet, you know, somewhat on the ground. So, you know, I wanted them to succeed. It wasn't, it wasn't a... Uh, like a bitterness factor or anything like that. But on a personal level, I didn't want to go near the place for yeah. quite a while. You see that? Yeah. Pat Wright still has a sign I think you put in the window when it closed. What, I don't know something what it just crudely written on a piece of cardboard or something said, Gilman is closed due to apathy of the audience or something or other. I don't really know. Right. I'm not really quoting it. Right. But uh, right. something like he wants me to take a picture. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I mean, everyone thinks it's kind of neat that it started up again and people cared enough to, right. to take it over. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave most of your memorable experiences there. Um, I'm just gonna, I don't want to get too much into what it's like now, but um, what do you think about like the whole major label thing now? The bands using it as a stepping stone? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, okay, you can say, all right, we're not going to have major label bands play, and I think that's good. That's really good. Um, but that doesn't exclude the mentality. In other words, there's still oh, I know. <laughs> so many bands that are wannabes, uh, as you all know. Um, and there's no way of discerning that. Unless you had, I mean, I really, I think it would be good to go back to the policy of, especially since Gilman has a financial cushion now to go back to try and do more radical things like go back to that policy of making the bands fucking clean up we, we tried that once on a free show with Screw 32 and some of the bands didn't work at all right they wanted the free show and blah 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 and, and they wanted this big Sunday thing and Sunday shows 
just a strain on the workers, so we don't do them that often. Uh -huh. And uh, we did it, and it, the condition was we didn't want to have to charge up all the workers. The vans were going to do most of the work. It just did not work. It was right. a big disaster. Right. It led to a lot of bad blood. Uh -huh. Yeah. And now we're talking about drawing names out of hats for order sometimes because we're sick of that. Like, uh -huh. I have to play last, or we're not net, we're not playing last, even though it's the only band really that should be playing last. Uh -huh. Band showing up late so they can play later. Uh -huh. No one enacting the rules that have existed forever, like you're supposed to be there by seven, eight o'clock at the latest, right. or you don't play. Right. Just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the club is in a position to 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 take some chances, and so you know because you have that cushion. So if you alienate a bunch of people for a while, that's fine. Yeah, that's how you I can do that. And that's you why know, I'll, book, I'll book dike shows that, that I know hardly anyone's going to come to, mm -hmm. or. Uh, experimental bands or something or just have smaller bands headline because you know then we can afford to lose a little money mm -hmm. or, or give almost all our money if not all our money to the bands that night mm -hmm. every once in a while mm -hmm. right. the business minded people in that club do not like that at all mm -hmm. the more money we make the tighter we get about it right and it's you know the weird thing now is is every even in the summertime now all the bands are had all the local all the headliners are local. A, a touring headliner is a thing of the past. You know? huh. Yeah, the days of like right. a Discord band coming through and headlining are, or except for a few small, a few bands like I don't know, Naked Aggression or something that's still around that oh, comes mm -hmm. through and headlines. Mm -hmm. It's it's all like AFI Street 32 dead and gone. Right. It's no matter what. And mm -hmm. Those bands only play once a month, so it's like it's it's kind of strange. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Scene is is like a local scene again, but. People want like 400 people at every show, right. and that's not going to happen. Right. The same bands are playing every single month. Uh -huh. um, well, we can talk about um, memorabilia because I want to eventually. The book gets a little further on my. See if you have stuff we can copy for the book and stuff. All right. Although you'd have to take it down off. Although Brian Edge apparently. Says he has all this stuff. Really? Uh, but he's out at sea right now. You know, I don't know. He'll be back in a few months. But he he said that he does have all this stuff. So. Yeah, I was supposed to talk to him before he left, and the whole thing right. got misinterpreted. He, he right. actually Charles interviewed him for something, but I don't know what happened. Right. But uh, yeah, any pictures and stuff I'm gonna put classifieds and right. MRR and. and uh, of attack and punk planet stuff going for people and take out their closets and old photos and stuff. Right. And go through and, and talk to different members of big bands like, you know, Mob Ivy or maybe Jello or something and talk about mm -hmm. them playing in the right. old days and stuff like that. Right. <laughs> um, if there's anything or anybody you can suggest, you know, feel free anytime. Um, did you ever see Bill Graham again later on? Like, after it had come or anything like that. Yeah. See, the rumor I had heard was it was not the Gilman was started, but like he dared you or something, or made a little bet with you or something that it, it couldn't happen. Yeah. Okay. See how things get perverted. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> It'll never happen. Um, yeah, everyone said you did it just to prove it. It could happen. Um, when it when it was. When you guys decided to, to get out to close it down, did you have a meeting about it? Was oh, it a yeah. membership meeting? Oh yeah. Do you remember what that was like? Or were there was everyone just like yeah? Most of us were <laughs> pretty righteous in our desire to <laughs> never see the fucking place again. Um, I remember there was a mi definitely a minority of people that you know didn't want to see it shut down. But most of the people that were doing the work were fried. Yeah, the stories get told it was just you and you were doing all the work. Like the other guys don't get mentioned at all. It's like Tim O'Hanna got tired of it being Tim O'Hanna's right. club. Right. It's, you know, the way it gets told. Yeah, no, it was, uh, at that point, there were, co there were, it was a Friday coordinator, a Saturday coordinator, and a Sunday coordinator. And, uh, I mean, for the first year, it was pretty much all of us trying to do it all at once, and it was mainly, like I said, Mark, Brian Edge, me, 
uh, Radley, um, Tall Tim, um, God, who else? I don't know. Tom Jennings. Uh, uh, I don't know. But, if, but there was maybe about a dozen people who were there most of the time. Not Lawrence. <laughs> and there were a lot of people who Japan, were, were, taken, who were taken credit over the years, but yeah. they were more sort of there as prima donnas occasionally. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, and and then so then we got this thing where like different like Jane Guskin coordinated Friday nights and she did the booking for Friday nights. And, and then, um, then I did Saturdays, and um, and that took a lot of pressure off to have that happen. Um, and then the last half year, there were a lot more people, like Honey Owens, and um, I don't know. There was a whole crew of coordinators, and that. But then, at, you know, at, even at that point, everyone was still fried. Just felt like they were being massive. How often did you have membership meetings? Monthly. Once a month. What is that? Once I got started, started having shows. Yeah, I can't remember, but I think I think they were monthly. No, it doesn't say, does it? I remember reading them in the old novels. Oh yeah, David Hayes. He was another one of the mainstays. Most of the people who wrote for Maximum were involved in Maximum were involved in Delta. Yeah. Well, yeah, we would just pile the, the car full and drive over and do it every day. Yeah, we had painting we had some plays there. Um, that still happens every once in a while. Did um, you do art shows or anything like that too? Yeah, we tried that once. We tried that recently. Mm, didn't really work, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, Did you have like theme nights like we do now, like uh, punk prom nights and uh, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. There Costume were, parties or? There were a couple of things like that. Um, was that part of the mindfuck thing, or was that just? Mm, uh, uh, maybe related. There was. Uh, I remember the best thing that they ever did was this thing called Pagan Goddess Worship Night, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was great. It was all women put together the whole thing. Um, they, um, besides being the performers, they made food. They had all sorts of information for people. They had redecorated the whole place so that like when you walk from the foyer into the main room, you walk through a giant vagina. <laughs> That's awesome. It was great. It was totally great. That was one of the best best things. Um, uh, what else? Did you ever get like stuff from kids parents or anything when you did stuff like that or just the club in general like like any of that stuff I don't remember even bad stuff happening yeah but I mean just like I mean I know about later on like with the Mary and stuff right, all the core right, stuff but right, like right. no really? I don't I don't remember any kind of complaint or runaways showing up there and I remember yeah. cops coming in looking for runaways yeah you know for Jeff Ott they were looking for <laughs> Jeff Ott <laughs> <laughs> he was hiding somewhere in the building, but um, 
I don't remember other. I don't remember any like major kind of confrontation with the city or with parents or. Or with the police, with all the violence problems? Were they yeah, well, the main problem with that is they got sick of being called down. Yeah. Yeah. And they just said, look, you guys are going to have to, in fact, this one cop said, look, you guys are going to have to go out there and beat the fuck out of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they said, we're, we're tired of coming down here and having to deal with this. Well, that's pretty much the mentality now if they right, show up. Right, like, You know, well, we can get the fuck out right now. Right. Yeah. Although, I mean, they were pretty, in general, pretty supportive. I mean, I was surprised that they didn't give us more shit or they didn't go out of their way to be bigger assholes. Um, in general, they would come down and just deal with whatever it was I had asked them to deal with. Um, so, most of the time it worked okay. Um, of course, there's going to be when I get into talking to people who are in involved with it more later on, we're gonna talk about all the big things that happened, like Cello breaking his leg, the Marion thing, right. the brew pub thing, the uh, spew bringing the baby skull and all that kind of stuff. So if there's any, if you want to talk about any of that stuff at all, like I know you know about the Marion stuff. Right. Like well, you were at, probably at the show, weren't you? Oh yeah. So, <laughs> so give, give me a little take on that. <laughs> I'm sure people are gonna, we're going to have lots of quotes from people about their memories of, of that whole incident. Well, I was outside. I just saw, when I got there, and Matt from Rancid and me were standing outside there watching. The c I had just come to pick her up after the show and watching the cops haul her across the street and having her stand out there naked for a half hour. Outside, they kept her naked. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, she was, like, totally happy to be well, there. Yeah, they, no, but I'm surprised they let her. <laughs> they just, no, they didn't put her in the car. They didn't put a wrap around her or nothing. I was just, like, watching this, like, amazed. Like, wow, this is really incredible. I wonder if I've yet pictures of that. Um, and, uh, <laughs> anyway, so that, you know, I don't know what else to say about all of that. Um, so that, that, what was the story with the guy who called the police? He was, uh... Something about the Dead Kennedys? Yeah, something? he was an original member of the Dead Kennedys. An original member? Yeah. What was his name? He had a number, I forget. If you look on their first, first seven inch yeah. their album... He was Wasn't he like a born again Christian at yeah. that point, though? Mm -hmm. but yeah, he was totally a uh, fundamentalist right wing. Jerk off. Didn't he have a crash on Marion or something? He he used he gave her flowers before the show, but he did that with a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's obviously got a problem with women, so I don't know what his deal is. But I mean, just like and that led to the benefit, <laughs> and then right. the whole <laughs> peeing right. on the kid and right. breaking Michael's arm and right. Oh. Wait, whose arm? What, didn't Michael Board's arm get broken? No. Was it? I thought he even got tied up or something, his arm got broken or something or other. And he went to the S and M party that night oh. with a cast or something. Because I remember people coming outside and asking yeah. me, Would you like to tie up Michael Board? And I was like, No. They're like, Oh, it's a surprise, come on, just do it. I'm like, Uh, no. Right. And then I was like, Mary, you know, keep things down, you know, there could be undercover cops here and stuff. <laughs> well, she sure did, bitch. <laughs> no, she sure did. <laughs> she sure pissed me off. Oh yeah, all of us. <laughs> um, but yeah, maybe he. I don't think it actually broke, but I think mm -hmm. something happened. Where I remember him being really pissed off. Oh, him. he was really pissed off, right? Namely, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, who was it? George Taylor. He was really pissed off at somebody. Anyway, they, he punched somebody. He punched somebody in the face. I can't yeah, I was on the side. I missed yeah. most of it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh... <laughs> what about the, 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 whole, the whole baby skull thing incident? Were you around when any of that happened? Um, I remember you doing something in Maximum. Yeah, I... I, I printed the story about it and Ben I know Ben is still got, sore about that. Really upset about <laughs> it. <laughs> He's still sore about it. Right. 
I, he asked, begged me not to print the story, but I felt like, oh wait, this was really, people should know about this. Okay, bye Alan, thanks. I mean, this is amazingly, incredibly dumb, you know, that people jeopardize the place like that. <coughs> um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try to get, get a quote at him for, for the book after you want to talk about it. He swears that like, it was all the other guys who was just along for the ride. Right. I mean, maybe that was true. I'm I sure it was. But, uh, <laughs> I'll get Jeremy to talk about it. We'll talk for everybody. Right, right. Um, or, or the jello breaking his, his leg thing, or the brew pub, if you know anything. Or well, I, I, all I know with the Jello thing is that I went and talked to as many people as possible who either saw what happened or whatever. And it just seemed to me like what he was putting out was that people were intentionally out to get him, and it just didn't seem that way. I was there that night. Those trustees didn't know who he was. They were just being dicks. Right. He had to be the pit monitor to stand at the edge and wait for him to touch him. Right. And then he reacted and right. he got hurt. Right. Yeah. I remember at a meeting where people were trying to hatch a plan to, to lure the Christmas back in and lock the doors and call the cops. That was crazy. All this for Jello. Right. We still call our uh, financial mission the Jello Fund in case he right. hits the lawyers, which he says he can't control. Um, <laughs> that's what you said. My lawyers may take, you know, I have no control. They might sue you right. for my legal costs and my yeah. medical costs. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the Jello Fund. Our secret account. The Jello Fund. Um, or the Brew Pub. I, See, I never understood that. I didn't know what. I didn't. Yeah. I, 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 I didn't perceive that as being a major threat. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm not that close to it all either, so. Well, that, that was more than before. I had right. talked to the zoning board several times about that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was more a gentrification and neighborhood right. issue. Right. Not specific. And it was really sad that Yellen was the only people, even though we tried to organize the neighborhood, who gave a shit. Mm -hmm. People after the fact said, "Oh, I didn't do anything." Mm -hmm. um, or any. I mean, those are most of those things are just things that happened in the three yeah. years I've lived here. Right. Like Yellen, is there stuff you remember besides yeah. like the Nazi stuff and all that stuff in the beginning? Um, like maybe some stuff like when it reopened. Gosh, I don't know. I don't remember that many. Maybe I cleansed my. I heard about the dwarves almost burning the place down once or something. No, yeah. no, no certainly not <laughs> during the first <laughs> Gilman. <laughs> they pissed off a lot of people, mm -hmm. um, but I don't remember it. That may have there may have been some incident that took place in the later. Did you have a no homophobic, sexist, racist um, policy for Banfman? One stated. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I think we probably did actually. Because um, people accuse us of having so many rules, but it's like the only right. one I think we've added on from the beginning that I know right. of is the major labels. Right. It's like, ooh, no bigots or major labels. There's a lot of rules for it. Right. Um, yeah, I can't remember. It what, I mean, I think the way it was explained, when bands would call up to get booked, I would tell them, okay, here's how it works. Um, you're going to do the work, you're going to do cleanup, um, you'll get a fair cut of the door. We, I think at that time we were only taking like 30 or 40 percent, something like that. Um, Did you take money on benefits as well, like we do now? Mm -hmm. We still get our 50 percent no matter what. Yeah, I don't think we did at the time. Um, and you're going to ha have to answer to people. Um, so, like, I was doing the booking. So, you know, in terms of racist stuff, I wouldn't book it. Right. In terms of sexist stuff, it's a harder call. So, you know, it's like, okay, what about the dwarves? Is this, is this, uh... Me and Jesse still argue about black dying. <laughs> right. So, I don't know, it's not as black and white. And <laughs> no pun intended. Right. <laughs> and my you know, like you know, like what happened with the feeders, you know, a lot of people, you know, turned in their membership, burned up their membership cards or whatever, that we'll never come back here again. Because of one band doing something. Right. Right. 
And it was amazing to watch people act like Nazis. It was just like, holy shit. In a couple of weeks, they're going to be really embarrassed about what they just did. What, did you have to 86 people like we do on a constant basis oh, yeah. now? Like yeah, vote them out? Yeah, but, but it was, I mean, I don't know how it is now, but it was, it was way stringent then. I mean, it was like, if you were out, you know, your, your names, you know, got, a face got memorized by a bunch of us. And if you came in, you were, you were not, I mean, there'd be 10, 20 people every night outside the door who couldn't get in. Theory, who you know would then go out and start shit up in the neighborhood. And that was part of the problem is that we had 86 so many people, and there was this crew. I don't know. Is this guy Screamer still around? Vaguely, I saw him. I've seen him in the last few years. Yeah, he's kind of like a rock and roll type. He's not racist anymore. So. Right. But there was this whole drinking, fucked up crew, besides the skinheads. And there, I mean, there were all these different gangs. Gangs that would go down. Did a lot of them come from the South Bay because they seem to now. Well, there was another crew called the East Bay Fuck Ups. No, not the East Bay Fuck Ups, the, the San Jose Fuck Ups, who uh, would come in with weapons. And, uh, and we had to 86 people with knives and guns. <laughs> and. Um, Fascist. And over <laughs> later on, I found out, you know, years later, I found out how badass these guys really were, and I was just amazed that we didn't get killed, because these guys kill people. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, holy shit, we fucked with those people. Anyway, no, there was a lot of people that got 86. Yeah. Did you vote them out of membership meetings and have that, like, because now we do it usually for, like, a year, like, it makes pay or... If they come to a meeting, but they never do. Yeah, you, like Billy really Joe's still 86 you know, <laughs> from drinking in the girls' bath. Right. No, we had a thing where you were 86, but then if you wanted to come back, you would have to come to a meeting and appeal your case or whatever. And uh, so someone like Eric Yee, um, you know, several times. He's he been 86 a million times. Right. No, he, he was amazing. He's been 86 so many times. Um, so there'd be, you know, certain people that, or certain bands that were 86. You know if that would happen? Not from playing or from coming? Uh, mainly from coming. Um, sometimes from playing. I remember some show where... So you could be banned from coming to place but still play? No. I mean, but in other words, not just for what you may have done on stage, but but what just for did being is, a Tory right, fan of right. Um, what, what all I hear all the stories about all these punk gangs and the Death Wish kids and like people say that's what the U.S. thugs are now. It's just like the incarnation of like all the old East Bay and West Bay punk gangs from back then. Right. Eric E. could probably like. Yeah, list them all up. Was that any of that a reaction to all the skinhead gangs or anything? No, it was all simultaneous, and they were all. In other words, it was just fuck, fucked up people who chose different, you know, monikers for. But there was this thing called EBU, um, and they were, they were the most fucked up East Bay crew of people, and their D was associated with so them. East Bay what? United? I have no idea. Fucking <laughs> fucker team. <laughs> but they were really fucked up assholes. Um, uh, who else? You said. Um, then there were all these different skin groups, and I didn't know who all of them were. But and at that point, they were, they were all racist. That was sort of before it was there was any anti-racist. So it was like. They were all racist, <laughs> you know. Um, now the South Bay fans and the Bay City fans follow this many editors wherever Bay City is. Right. <laughs> yeah, this must be Santa Cruz. Oh no, the city. Um, to the Bay City Rollers every time they say the last. Anyway, but there were yeah. I mean, coming out of the you know, but '84 was sort of the hey '84 '85 were the heydays of stupid punk gangs. And that carried on into about 88 or so before 
finally disappeared more or less. <coughs> um, so, just to, to clarify it, so you got the lease in April of 86, right. and the first show was the last day of that year. The yeah. first day. Yeah. And, yeah, gosh, that took you all summer building up. Huh? And then through the fall. Right. She, right. You were paying rent on it that whole time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Yeah. But I mean, we, you know, we had to do major fucking, you know, stuff that we, none of us had any idea. Do you remember what the date? Yeah. Do you remember what the date was when, when you had your last show? When it closed down? Or how long it was closed? Or when it reopened? That's anymore? a good question. No, I don't. People tell me six months, people tell me eight months, people say four months. I always hear different stories. Uh, boy, I don't remember. Do you remember vaguely, though, like, not exactly, like, no. how many months it was closed? No, actually, I don't. You were so burnt, you didn't want to go near it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, I mean, just in, like, two or three years or whatever I've been there, I hardly go to any shows anymore. And it's like bands I'd go to see normally. Right. I just don't go there to like help out anymore. Do my right. booking thing every week. Go to the meetings. Right. I just don't give a shit about AFI. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have a strong memory of one. Yeah, because there was all that bait about what the 10 year anniversary is, and we just kind of just decided like, you know, when the first show was. Right. We'll just count that. Right. Yeah. That's interesting that I actually started doing the book uh, the month ago, so I at least. You started what? Started the book on the 10 year anniversary of the lease sign. I've been talking about this book for like a year, year and a half, but uh -huh. I couldn't get anybody to help me with it all. Now I finally got people, hopefully they won't all flake, but it'll help me transcribe it and type it and all that shit. And I, oh. We had a robbery once. Oh, really? Yeah. Guy came in and uh, I think he had a knife and got the money from the cash box right at the door. And then somehow David Hayes, you know David Hayes? I know who he is. Mm -hmm. He runs too many records. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, David's not a big guy. Pretty scrawny guy. He jumped on the guy's back and rode him back down the street until the rest of us caught up. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the most amazing sights. Ever. And David's not like a macho dude or anything. And somehow he jumped on this fucker's back and rode him down until we caught up. And you got the money back? Yeah. Did you guys call the cops or let the guy go? Or? We did call the cops. And I think we let him go before the cops got there. The guy was, he was like, we broke him down black guy and he was just like the saddest face in the world and we scared him and then let him go. I'm surprised he doesn't get around more often. Right. Yeah, we just take two steps in, grab it and run. Right. Right. Point a gun and knife right. and there's we do jobs pretty regularly, so they probably wouldn't get much money, but so mm -hmm. No oh yeah, like what else? The sound the sound system, the original sound system. Um, I worked up at Lawrence Hall of Science and they have a shop up there. And some of the guys that worked at the shop up there when, when we were working on Gilman uh, constructed the whole sound system on oh, really? UC Berkeley Company time <laughs> and, uh, and then brought it down and installed the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, that was totally great. <coughs> that was really cool. Um, what, what, what would the bathrooms and stuff, how did all that work in the beginning? Did you have two bathrooms just like they are now? No. There was a bathroom about the size of this table um, that uh, we had to rip out. Yeah? It was under... What was the place before you moved in? Or I don't know what had been there prior. I mean, at one point it, it had been some kind of either warehouse or supermarket for groceries or something uh -huh. at one point. But um, anyway, no, the city came in and said, okay, if you're going to be zoned for X amount of people, you have to have bathrooms this size and wheelchair accessible and blah, blah, blah. So we had somebody come in and draw a you know, map of what we'd have to do and then we had to 
you know, you know, dig up the floor, find the pipe. We couldn't even find the fucking pipes. We had to <laughs> dig around until we found oh, the fucking man. pipes and put in new piping. See, all the blueprints of the old building. No, oh. no, they had guesses where the pipes were, but it wasn't right. Um, and then we had to build the wall. You know, put in the fixtures, put in the toilets. The Was everything. the office there? Did you have to build the wall or any of that kind of stuff? The store? No, the, where the store and office, those were separate rooms as they are now. They were already... When did the store come in? That was a while later, wasn't it? No, that was right at the... Oh, really? Right. Yeah. Who um, ran the store in the beginning, or did everyone? Uh, the first person that was in charge of the store was this guy, Tom, who had been in uh, one of the early Berkeley Peace Punk bands. I don't remember which one, but... <laughs> He ran the store, and the office was not an office; it was a lounge for everybody, and uh, so anyone could go in. There was no office; the only it still was basically a lounge for the workers. Right, but it was it, at that point it was a lounge for everybody. You do have to get in and out of there during shows now. Right. Like I can walk right um. And uh, but like um. trying to remember some of the other things. Yeah, building those bathrooms was a nightmare. So they're not the same bathrooms anymore? I know Pat built these no. bathrooms. No, it looks the same. Oh, it is? Yeah. Was Pat helping you guys back then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's been around. Right. What about Richard? Um, he, was, he came in towards the end of the, the first deal. Right. Pat's still around. What about John Hart? No, he wasn't there then. How did you guys handle accounting and finances and taxes and shit? Just the same. Just got friends and, or you guys did it yourself? No, it was through Matt Maximum. In other words, uh, well, I guess you had some experience in there. Yeah, it was all run through Maximum's accounts. Oh, really? In other words, there wasn't so it was a separate. An extension. There wasn't a separate uh, account, and all I would do is make sure, you know, like I do now, that we, by the end of each year, we get rid of all our money. Therefore, we can't be taxed for anything. So it worked the same way. Um, so the original name was what? The Gilman Street Project? Yeah. Or did it happen? The was Gilman the Gilman Street, Street Project. Uh, did did it, it change during your tenure? No. Or did it change when it reopened? Yeah, when it reopened. It, when it, did it open under 94 Gilman? No, then it was the alternative. Music Foundation? Right. Yeah, it's still what our PO box is. Right. Oh, really? It was called that, the alternative? And that? Yeah, I think so. Really? Are there flyers that say the A and that? I don't know. These are all first yeah. first things. But oh, that's interesting. I wonder why it won't change to 1924 Gilman. I always called it the Gilman mm-hmm. on the East Coast, right. reading it. Or the Gilman Street Project, right. or the Gilman Street Warehouse. Right. But now it says 1924 Gilman. Right. Yeah. It, I don't know if that was the third thing or. Or that's just how it got to be called after the second. The Gilman Street Project, 94 Gilman Street Project Warehouse. <laughs> oh, this, this is funny. All right, here's the thing saying we're open. And uh, it's telling the band that played the first couple of nights. And... Oh, Soup. The legendary Soup. Yeah. Big Stanley. Justice League? That's right. See, you know, variety back then. That's so rad. So many people just think of, you know, East Bay pop punk bands are the only bands who ever played Gilman. So, uh, it was sort of after the fact that we were telling people what bands had played. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, look what you missed last week. You never know who's going to play this week. Right. Yeah. Social unrest. <laughs> yeah, Gilman Street Warehouse. Yeah, the nut fire says thank you for the gentleman. Right. Yeah, that'd be neat if Brian Edge does have these flyers or right. they can make copies and shrink them and stuff. Yeah, so this explains the <laughs> <laughs> there is a, also a policy of no advertising of specific bands. 
only that shows will take place on a given day. Hmm. Anyway, that was the idea. Naked lady wrestlers. Yeah, actually, here they are. This was one of the funnest, uh, funnest nights at Gilman. <coughs> we have the stage. It was going to be a battle of the bands. Here, can actually raise the flyer for it. How did those battle of the bands work? Did somebody uh, win? <laughs> well, I'll explain that. This one here. So we had a it was naked lady wrestling versus <laughs> aristocracy. And we oh, it wasn't a whole bunch of bands. It was like no, <laughs> no well, not, yeah. This was more a real battle of the bands type thing. And we have the stage with um, set up like a uh, boxing ring. So we had polos and ropes, and we had an announcer. Walter Glazer was the announcer, the, the public address announcer. And each band would get one band would get up, play one song, get down, and the other band would go up, play a song, get down. We had an applause meter, and people had a load <laughs> on which band they thought did better. And then, at the end of the night, there was a, um, a voting thing out at the front desk, and then people had to go vote. And here's the members of, Ice, of uh, Naked Light and the Wrestlers stuffing the ballot box. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that but that was a, that was totally Is that how most battle of bands work? You no, the, the rest weren't really battle of bands. Just like, so like just kinda like new band night Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't really battle of the bands. I think we're gonna have we're gonna have them try maybe like thirty bands in a weekend on the ten year anniversary. I mean thirty club had ninety. <laughs> When, like, whenever we, uh, Sticky would play, they would do all sorts of weird things, like, you know, they had a, they did a bingo thing that they <laughs> had everyone, they had to play the bingo game, or, um, they would give out milk and cookies to everyone, because they wanted to prove that they were more straight edge than straight edge Fire. people. Fire and give up the right. Um, we had certain nights where, I mean, a lot of times you'd have giveaways, like here, like, um, you could win a free bike, or bike parts, or whatever, at that show, where we had things like, if you brought uh, one of those big wheels, you know, those, you know, if you brought one of those, you got in free. <laughs> so How people, random. <laughs> what do you do with the stuff? Give it to kids or something? Um, what, the, the yeah. no, no, actually, we leave, well, my whole idea was, get enough people in the pit in big wheels instead of beating the shit out of each other. It'd be, <laughs> it'd be, like, be like yeah, it would be like bumping cars, right? That's right. And so we had all these, little, like, all these people out in the pit and, <laughs> and, and all these big macho dudes looking around and these people, people scooting around them. It was great. Totally fun. Do you have things out. like we still do like at Christmas, like we bring a gift, get a gift? Strangers or Halloween costume parties, or, or did you ever serve food? Potlucks yeah, or there was yeah there were sometimes potlucks and food. But is food not bombs ever served or any that kind of stuff? No, well there was. There it was, was a San Francisco food not bombs. Yeah, though, right. Did you do a lot of benefits in the first year? Um, I don't know about a lot. I think there was. I think we had a policy of only one a month or something. Right. Oh, three magic. Penny Shakur. <laughs> 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 we had a basketball tournament. Did you really? Yeah. Different punk teams. Um, is that who's? Is that the same who? Still there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it was uh, vegans versus vegetarians versus omnivores. They even had vegans that ma that many back then. Oh yeah. Wow. Well, California. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that many um, but that actually that was uh, that was pretty fun. Was that like during the show or? Yeah, it was part of the show. Right. <laughs> 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 Punk and pumpkin. <laughs> 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 
Every time my soccer team would play, it was uh, it was amazing. They would bring Al Sobrante was a collector of stuff, and so when they play, he would bring stuff. And by the end of the show, the you, if you took all the garbage that eventually rained down, you could fill. The kitchen probably to about this high. Well, that's how much stuff I had to take it to the dump. Whatever. Whatever. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And so their shows were like, that's what their shows were like. It was like carnival. And they threw them in the audience? Yeah, everything. So people were into it? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it, he would, every time it would be something like, I remember this, it, things were getting really rushed at a lot of shows, and so Al, this one show, he got. You know, it's like cellophane, except, you know, instead of like a Those little roll, sheets. it's like this, a roll with this big... That happened sheet. like three years ago once, yeah. too. And everyone in the club got wrapped up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I said something once in DC, too. I think, like, I'm going to see that and go, ah. <laughs> and it's great, because all these big guys yeah, go like this, and everybody's like, getting all caught. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> they their thing. <laughs> totally fucked them up. I always wanted to get those those blow up sumo suits. Like right. going to the pit with one of those things. Right. There's a thing for self defense classes. I forgot about that. That went on for a while. That was still in there. Um ALF benefit. Mm-hmm. Was, was it for the defense or did it go straight to like some guy who was in the ALF? I don't remember. There you need to see master and <laughs> go. Wow. Um, see, things like that in D.C., we had Secret Service guys that are taking pictures of our car license plates and crowd shots. Mm -hmm. We didn't notice them, like, trying to blend in and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, this was a cool show. We got all these bands. Um, like, who was it? Special Forces, Mr. T, Sweet Baby Jesus, Bob Ivy. Mr. T still around. Anyway, so you'd only do Ramon songs. Oh, really? And so we had all these bands learn a set just for this one night. You know, and that's really great. You know, it's like a tribute show. You know, <laughs> or right. it, or totally, you know, Ramon's name. You know, they would go about well, a good band too, unless you learn a Ramon song. Yeah, right. Right, and everyone would do it a different way, like, you know, I'll buy it, we would do a Ramon song, a very different. A scoff running that. That's right. That's right. Um, but, you know, in other words, we could get people to do something like that for the joy of doing something weird, you know, out of the ordinary. Um, and I it kind of got, I heard later on, like, people were running out of ideas, so like, people like Jesse when they were working with, with Lara, you know, and Gelman would, would just like, hey, let's book a Nazi band with a, with a, peace, <laughs> with a peace, peace punk band. <laughs> right. Like, I came through on a tour with this man underside, and he booked us with, with, uh, Total Fucks. And the only people there, there were five people there, and they were, they were holding up picket signs. So <laughs> Total Fucks should play here, because it's like, the racist and sexist thing was getting raped on the street. I was like, oh, God, Jesse. <laughs> Still argue about it. <laughs> See, actually, recently I booked a fucking right wing reactionary straight edge, post straight edge band from Orange County, Ignite. Mm -hmm. with no finance, remember, right. and stuff. With uh, Mike Kirsch's band, um, mm -hmm. Torches to Rome, and uh, some other straight edge bands, and some other emo bands, just because I knew that, like, something was going to happen. Right. And sure enough, we had this hour long, huge debate on stage after cool. Ignite finished about, like, sexism and racism and kept going. The singer was like, hardcore's like a fist. Open it up, you got all these branches, you know, the Krishnas and the straight edge and the vegans, and you got to come all together. I'm like, I'm not coming together with a bunch of right-wing jerks, a bunch of religious yeah. freaks. I'm like, don't tell me that shit. I'm coming into Gilman and, like, he was, like, going on and on and on about all this right 
<laughs> crazy <laughs> shit. And like, and like the pit was crazy that night. We were like telling people to calm down. And some women got really angry and he was like, Dick, women could go start their own band. Like this is about the brotherhood and all this stuff. And we were just like, oh God. and these women were, were arguing with him and, and uh, Jose from, from Struggle and, and all these bands down south. He was like, I'm a minority, you shut the fuck up, you, you rich white boy, and like, it's just big, and it was so rad, so that's what I envision when I book shows like that, it right. rarely happens, mm -hmm. and the open mic thing is that people still bring that up once while, if you guys have a problem, mm -hmm. come up here and talk about it, of course, almost nobody, right. I've tried like getting pe people to, to be the, the MCs for the night, mm -hmm. and, and Jesse will occasionally do it, or right. I'll do it, but, but only the extroverts, to, you know, it's, yeah. No, that's actually that's a Lawrence occasionally would be an MC, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Walter Glazer would sometimes be an MC. And that was something that I, uh, Dirk at the Mab, that was his shtick, being an MC, and he, you know, he would just insult the bands, insult the audience, just like it was totally great. And um, it was something I always wanted to see happen at, at Yeoman, was to have somebody who would could put that kind of focus on something, you know. Um, also, just to get up there and say, look, don't do graffiti outside, don't right. trash the club, right. and you know, just explain a few gentlemen basics. Right. Like, right. like, you know, this membership card is, is, mm -hmm. is here for a reason, and mm -hmm. don't take it. Yeah. If I do it every once in a while, take shows, I think we have to have to big shows. Mm -hmm. Just go outside and tag all over the place. Right. All that fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. I think we're, we've kind of rescinded the get in free during the last band policy. Mm -hmm. Did you guys have that policy then? No. We, we hate that policy. The, it dropped, the money dropped during... See, I recommended that, but no one will go for that. It went from... Because yeah, like, everyone's just going to show up for the last band right. and pay a couple bucks. Right. I mean, what I think ended up being was like, you know, let's say it was $4, and then $3, and then $2 at the end of the night. But I always felt it should be the opposite. Yeah, two dollars, three dollars, and then four dollars at the end of the night. I'd go for that. You know, and I, that's what I think. Yeah, but that never flew. <laughs> yeah, anything to get the people there earlier would be okay with me. Uh-huh. But I think if you get in free at seven, if you volunteer and become a part of the club, right. why reward people that, that show up like really, really late and like, mm -hmm. get in for, for after two songs of the last band and say, well, oh, people can afford it. But Right. Really, you know, right. They always can afford the beer they're drinking, right. but they can't afford that's it. Right. You know, that's a bunch of fucking crap. Yeah. Yeah. That is totally bullshit. And, and since we've like stopped letting people in, like people, I said mostly the West Bay people who come over late, like wait around, they're used to getting in late. Like, mm -hmm. Even my first year, I was fortunate to break down. But also, we should cut and pay to get Were you guys? Did you guys fire some people who borrowed membership cards? Yeah, we would. Uh, uh, you were 86 if you got caught. Really? Oh, no, yeah. That's so, that's so last about that now. Mm -hmm. No, we would, you know, somebody, I would, in fact, I would, <laughs> you know, I would catch people all the time. People were not very clever. Oh, no. But, you know, Walk up and go up. And then they'd be passing it, and they'd be the behind them. But I would just bust people all the time and say, okay, bye. So just take the damn car. Yeah, no, hit the car. Yeah, hit the car. Yeah, hit the car. Goodbye. Yeah. <coughs> I think we should be. Think was about that now. Right. But we had really, I mean, we alienated a lot of people, and that, that was the second group that uh, did Gilman went out of their way to sort of make up to the people that we had alienated, and so they had a much more lax approach, which I think had its good points and bad points. Okay. I mean, it can prevent burnout to a degree. Yeah. Right. Um, although, I mean, in, it seems like for most of the people that have sort of done the more hardcore jobs at Gilman, it's about a two-year yeah, ceiling yeah. when they burn out. Yeah. Maybe it'll be different now that I mean, if Charles is getting paid something, maybe it's a, a different yeah, I thing. I was on tour when I was thinking about it. Right. I was shocked and like, you right. know, what, you know have they always paid security guys? No. Um, when we hired the outside security, we paid them, but when we were doing it ourselves, no. When did Nando show up, do you remember? It was after it was the second group. Yeah. She's been around a while. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's what I, actually what I did when I first moved here was paid security. Mm-hmm. Well, mom's here and I did it you know, for a month or two. Oh, yeah. oh, that job's actually unbelievable. Right. Like such an asshole telling people not to drink. Right. Right. Or it's the whole. Good. Yeah. Or enforcing the couple rules. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, you must have got that a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, we were. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, we have bad reputation to begin with in terms of being uh, self-righteous or whatever. And then on top of that, uh, um, and we actively enforce policing one block in each direction. Okay. You know, so. <clears throat> you know, it's a yeah. I don't know about back then. I, I imagine it's probably the same as now. But people who seem to like go in the bushes and drink right by the club seem to be like people who have worked at Yelm in the past who still kind of do, yeah. <laughs> or like people yeah. that work at Maximum or like right. you know. No, it wasn't that way. Though. Really? Yeah. It's, it's, it seems to me the industry to do that shit. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the Ericies and the well, Molly yeah. Donovans and and. Yeah. Images, people, you know, right. just people you wouldn't expect to. Well, no, but he hangs out with those people. No, but he's around those people that are like that going, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All the epicenter people come there and do that kind of shit. What are you uh, doing? Right. Now, if I ever caught anyone who was actually working, in fact, I remember it was the time when I caught somebody who was burning, burning at the place. Who was Brandon did that. Out <laughs> drinking. The, the security person was out drinking. Oh my god. And uh, I remember I lost the code when that happened. Did you ever have security guards beat the shit out of people? Like get hard, get mad at them because that happens now? No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can come down like that. Or did people sneak in beers a lot back right? then? They kind of thing. They would try, but we were really. I mean, people really don't try that often. Right. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I was so protective of the place. I mean, it's it's weird. Like if you're the if you give birth to the thing, your attitude is going to be different. In other words, I you know I'm sure everyone you know who was working there today surprises what they have, but they didn't have to go through mm, yeah. the birth and the, you know taking it from an idea to a reality and then watching fuckheads come right. in. Who, you know, and you put in so much, you fucking just killed yourself, yeah, and then there's it. a jerk off here. So I was, re- I'd be really harsh on people, you know. If I yeah, that's why I stopped doing security because I kept beating up people that I did. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't do it. I'm from the East Coast, and if, mm-hmm. you know, if none of this. Peace punk stuff. I didn't right. grow up with that, you know. Right. I grew up with even Ian and Yee beating the shit out of people when right. they got out of hand. Right. I probably still will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. Ooh. And you got people like Eggplant going, like, just give them a big hug, you know. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you know fuck that, you know. And it's always the scenes. There's all of the that live in the neighborhood who have been coming there on and off for 10 years, and, and people are like, no, I'll let them go. And people want to get up with you, and they're like, mm-hmm. no. No, mm-hmm. none of the old school shit count. Right. I mean, it counts for something, but it's, you know, it doesn't make it more important than, mm-hmm. than the people who are, you know, doing all the volunteer hours now. Mm-hmm. That's what drives me crazy. Is, is I've been the only consistent booker for like, two years now. And, uh, and so I just head booking the thing. You know, whatever happens with the show, to me. You know, mm-hmm. every time. That's why I hate going to shows that I book half the time because it's like, did you do this? Did you? Mm-hmm. And nobody had. I mean, so I can fathom what you were going through because just with booking shows now, it's like I get the blame if like no one's there or mm-hmm. too many people there, or the wrong crowds attracted or bands that hate each other. Or